Also, I noticed that it looks like it's conventional not to notice that we need two equivalents of sodium here, even though it seems like we do, but they didn't write that in the book usually. Even though we need the two equivalents, they don't usually write that. All right, so let's summarize the key features here. We have two neutral sodiums, and those add a single electron each time. The important thing to notice is that we ended up with a trans addition. The hydrogens ended up opposite to each other. And you can see what's happening here. When, uh, when we add the first electron, the molecule arranges itself so that the substituents are trans to minimize steric hindrance. And that determines that we're going to get the trans arrangement from that point on. Then we get a hydrogen from the ammonia. Then we add another electron from another sodium, and we get another hydrogen from another ammonia. So the most important thing to see here, again, is the trans addition. And I've just been following along the mechanism in the book. I don't see any steps where we really need the water here. But one thing we could say is, if you just do it this way, you end up with this very strong base. So maybe we just want to quench the base by adding some water. We really, we really couldn't do anything else with this until we get rid of this strong basic species over here. So it seems to me like the purpose of the water here is just to neutralize the base that we're generating. Pardon? I don't think you even have to bother showing that. In fact, in most cases, you probably don't even have to bother showing this mechanism. You probably don't need to bother showing the mechanism unless you're asked for it. Uh, this is not one of the most crucial mechanisms, I would say. They didn't show it, uh, but it wouldn't be hard to show that the water neutralizing the base. It would just be protonating the base, basically. Um, but, um, yeah. Other than uh, neutralizing the base, I, or protonating the base, I can't see much purpose of the water here. But they, they did include that as one of the reagents here in the back. In fact, uh, in one case, they even showed H3O plus here. That would really quench. Yeah, that would probably be better, actually. H3O plus would make more sense as a way to neutralize this base. So generally speaking, if we have a reaction that's generating base, it's oftentimes a good idea then to neutralize that base as you go along, because it might interfere with any future reactions you want to do. The important thing here is to compare this reaction and the reaction with the Lindlar catalyst. The reaction with the Lindlar catalyst was a syn addition, and this was anti. Why was this a syn addition? Well, these two hydrogens attached from the same speck of palladium. But this is a trans addition because uh, they're not attaching from the same molecule over here. The two hydrogens come from different places. Wait, so what is that H3O plus converter? Well, do you see, it doesn't actually do anything to the main product. We don't need this to get the main product. But notice that as the reaction goes along, we're generating these strong bases. We're generating the sodium amide. Well, we want to neutralize that strong base because it might interfere with any further reactions we want to do, do along the way. The purpose of this reaction was to produce a trans alkene. It wasn't to produce a strong base. So in order to get rid of the strong base, we should add the H3O plus just to neutralize that base. That's actually not that uncommon. Sometimes when you're doing a reaction, as a byproduct, you're producing acid and base. Well, if you're producing acid and base as a byproduct of your reaction, maybe you need to add a counteracting acid or base to neutralize that. But the H3O plus isn't really playing a role in the main reaction that produces the alkene. So in the book, this is called Reduction with Sodium and Liquid Ammonia. It's a reduction because, remember, reduction is gain of electrons. And we're gaining electrons here. Oh, okay. Reduction with sodium and liquid ammonia. Remember, Leo the lion goes grr. Gain of electrons is reduction. Well, clearly, the alkyne here keeps gaining electrons from the sodiums. So what are the different types of hydrogenations we know? We know how to hydrogenate an alkyne all the way to an alkane, or we can hydrogenate it partially to an alkene. If you want to do the syn addition to get the cis alkene, you use the Lindlar catalyst, and to get the trans alkene, you do the reduction in liquid ammonia with sodium. Cool. probably be able to predict what's going to happen here just on the previous principles that we've learned. Even if we haven't seen this reaction before, we should be able to predict how this should we do all products? Pardon? Should we do all products? Because they're going to be 
let's do one product at a time and see what we get. Now, who would be a good nucleophile here? The triple bond. The triple bond. Even though it doesn't really have any charges, we've learned that carbon-carbon pi bonds are nucleophilic. We learned that for alkenes, and it's also true for alkynes. Carbon-carbon pi bonds are nucleophiles, which means they go at the tail of an arrow. And we already know that a hydrogen like this would be an electrophile because it has a partial positive charge and a good leaving group. We'll touch up the left That's a very good analysis. That's right. Notice that here we could end up with the hydrogen on the right or on the left, and therefore we could get the carbocation on the right or on the left. Well, where would we rather have the carbocation? On the more substituted carbon. We want to put the carbocation on the more substituted carbon. Why? Because alkyl groups are electron donating, so they stabilize this carbocation here. So this is similar to what we've seen before. And what would happen now? Now the Br would be on Br minus, but it's hot. In the first step, we also produced a Br minus, which was convenient because neutral bromine is not a good nucleophile, but Br minus is a good nucleophile. And obviously, a positive carbon is an excellent electrophile. Isn't it because it's a trigonal plane there can be a talk to their front or back? That's right. We have to worry about possibly getting more than one product. I don't think that's an issue here, though, because there really isn't any stereochemistry because there's two hydrogens. But that's something we might need to worry about. Well, also, there's no stereochemistry because it's a double wall. No, well, a double bond can have stereochemistry. It could be cis or trans. Oh, okay. A double bond can't be R and S, but it can be cis or trans. Okay. So double bonds can have stereochemistry. We'll see if that's an issue on some more complicated problems here. <coughs> so we get this product? Yes. OK, good. So we would call this an electrophilic addition, because the initial attacker is an electrophile. And I suppose we could say whether it was Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. Markovnikov. It was Markovnikov because the electronegative element ended up on the more substituted carbon for the usual reason. The bromine was attacking second here, and it attacks the carbocation, and we want to form the more substituted carbocation. So this should be very reminiscent of the addition reactions we saw for alkenes. Make sense so far? Yeah. Now, somebody was asking whether we should draw extra products. What, what, what else could happen here? Br could attack through the bottom instead of in the CH3 end up the top. Ah, now in this case that doesn't make any difference. Yeah, like yeah. In this case that doesn't make any difference. Okay, so before we get into that, something else that could happen here is suppose that we had started with two equivalents of hydrogen bromide. Uh, if we had started with two equivalents of hydrogen bromide, what could ha now happen here? Get rid of the double bond. Double now we could attack the double bond. So this is a reaction that can either go one step, it can either go to the alkene or the alkane, depending on how many equivalents of hydrogen bromide so you put in. So if they don't specify like one equivalence, then you have to go all the way through the alkanes? Actually, I suppose the convention here is that in this case, if they don't tell you how many equivalents, you need to assume it's just one equivalent. In this case, you have to assume it's only one equivalent. If they wanted to put in two equivalents, they'd have to tell you that, I think, here. Otherwise, we don't really have any clue as to how far we should take this, because this really could go either to the alkene or to the alkane. We'll have to look maybe at some sample exams or at the homework to see how they write this out. Okay. But I would imagine that in this case, they have to tell you how many equivalents there are. And if they don't specifically say it, I think you would probably assume it's just one. But we'll see if we'll see maybe the textbook writes this differently. Looking just here on, on the summary page of the textbook, it looks like when there's two equivalents, they actually specify that. All right, so let's try to draw the mechanism for the next step. If we had extra hydrogen bromide, or even if we only started with one equivalent of hydrogen bromide, we could now add an extra equivalent.
don't need to worry about the state of chemistry because there's no security centers. Right. Now, when this hydrogen attacks, again, the hydrogen has the choice. It can attach to the right or the left-hand carbon, but we know the hydrogen will still prefer the right-hand carbon because we still want to form the more substituted carbocation on the left. So it's the same principle as before. The hydrogen adds to the same carbon in both cases so that we can get the more substituted carbocation in both cases. And again, we have a bromide. 